You're listening to The Dead Prussian, a podcast about war and warfare. Now, as an Australian, for me, it's pretty obvious to get from here to there, wherever there is, as long as it's not Australia, I need to travel. Often, in fact always, I need to travel over water. In fact, to get home to my home state, I need to travel over water. And I really like going by water. Why? Because there's just something about landing on a beach that's heaps of fun. And I've done it a couple of times in some unfun contexts, but nowhere near as unfun as landing in an amphibious operation on a contested shoreline. There are a lot of people throughout history who have done exactly that. Most famous is probably the landings at Normandy. However, amphibious operations have a long and rich history in warfare that many of us probably aren't aware of. G'day listeners and welcome to The Dead Prussian. I'm your host, the humblest host there is of a 19th century. G'day listeners, I'm your host. No, fuck it. G'day listeners and welcome to The Dead Prussian. I'm your host Mick, the humblest host you know of a podcast named after a 19th century military Prussian theorist. Thank you very much for all your support. Thank you to the new members of our social network, the TDP community. If you don't know what that is, jump on our website and click on the TDP community and join us. It's pretty much a closed social network where our subscribers can hang out together, discuss things and access bonus content. So we're in the new year now. It's uh, a great year and it's proven already to be great just like 2020 was great. So what we might do is move straight into amphibious operations because they seem simpler than living through another year with a global pandemic and political turmoil. But history might tell me otherwise. Now, it's not just going to be me talking about amphibious operations. Uh, What I thought I'd do is talk to two people that have been on the show before so they know about my ignorance and also they know a fair bit about the topic I'm talking to. My guests today are Tim Heck and Brett Friedman. Tim Heck is an artilleryman by training, which makes him a good bloke. He's currently in the Marine Corps Reserve. He works as a freelance editor and historian. He attended Georgetown University and has an MA from the Department of War Studies at King's College London. He'll be teaching a course on the evolution of the US Army at Marine Corps University this spring and is working on an edited volume tentatively titled Armies in Retreat with Walker Mills, which is two surnames, but no one has told his co-editor that yet. B.A. Friedman, better known as Brett to me, or if you're really brave, Brendan, he grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, where Drew Carey was filmed, which he didn't include in his bio, but I know that. Or at least it was set, I'm not sure where it was filmed. Anyway, Brett entered the Marine Corps after graduating high school in 2000, which makes him an excellent human individual. Anyone who graduated high school in 2000 is top notch. He attended the Ohio State University and gained a BA in history as well as the Naval College where he gained an MA in National Security and Strategic Studies. He is a major in the Marine Corps Reserve, the author of On Tactics, published by Naval Institute Press, and is pursuing a PhD in Defence Studies through King's College London. Gentlemen, thank you both for coming back on the show. Thanks for having us, Mick. Yeah, great to be back. Now, gents, uh, before we start discussing your co-edited book about amphibious operations, uh, we've had plenty of chats before. Uh, Most of our chats have actually been uh, trying to um, coordinate this interview because I'm hopeless at scheduling, which is bad for an artilleryman. Um, The infantry get nervous when you're terrible at scheduling, uh, as you both know. But I'm actually interested to know, and also my listeners will be interested I think they can get a bit of an inkling from your backgrounds, but they're really interested to know what motivated you to enter the field of military and strategic studies. And we'll start with Tim and Brett, you can answer second. Yeah, I, um, I mean, my my journey to this book kind of started as you know that, that nerdy kid uh, who was subscribing to Civil War Times Illustrated as a fifth grader, um, which... 
you know, I think probably is indicative of a lot of things, but I started there and I just kept reading and learning. And, and in the, I don't know, it was February of 2002, I joined the Marine Corps. Um, Brett and I went to officer candidate school together. We went to initial trainings together. We went to Fort So we lived together. We're in the same reserve unit now. Like we just, our lives have paralleled in the, in the military. And I was starting a project uh, starting to write an article that was supposed to wind up in this book and didn't um, and looked around and said, Man, there, there's nothing recent on amphibious operations. Um, the, the Rusi Institute being in Australia did something, but there's not been a book on the subject in years. So I texted him. I was like, Hey man, you want to write a book <laughs> on amphibious ops? And it came back an immediate yes. Um, and that's how the book came out. But the, I mean, the studies, you know, it's that fifth grader sitting sitting in the library reading books. He's just now significantly older and, and emotionally better educated. But not sitting in a library. Uh, I just want to make that clear. We're not disturbing the peace in the library right now. I don't think we're allowed to go in libraries right now. It's actually a good thing. And, uh, and Brett, what about yourself? Uh, actually, remarkably similar, which is probably why we've kept in touch all these years. Um, I, my dad was a big history buff and my play area as a kid was in the basement and the whole base, all the basement walls were lined with books on military history, mostly American military history. And at some point I just started picking up reading I, and I was a freshman in high school and got in trouble in geometry class because I was sneaking a history of World War II below my desk and reading that instead of paying attention. So uh, I used to joke with my recruiter that I recruited him more than he recruited me <laughs> and uh, really it's just been uh as an artillery officer that initial trajectory just keeps going and going it's um it's all it's great to see you have such a good relationship with your recruiter uh, when i was recruited into the military i said i'm not sure the difference between a soldier and officer but i want to do the one with the less paperwork he said no problem we'll, uh, we'll make you an officer you won't you won't sit behind a desk a day in your career so uh, if you're out there i'm still looking for you kevin um, Tim and Brett, I guess for those people who understand what the Marine Corps do, uh, the topic of amphibious operations is not a strange topic uh, for a couple of Marines to get into. And, and the co-authored book we, we're discussing uh, as, the, as the centerpiece behind this discussion on amphibious operations called On Contested Shores. And uh, it's, you know, the, the subtitle is The Evolving Role of Amphibious Operations operations in the history of warfare which you know is kind of a big a big task when you think about the history of warfare um but i guess apart from me just continually saying the word amphibious operations uh, are you able to provide our listeners with an actual uh understanding of maybe an overview of the premise of the book and uh we'll reverse the order so we'll go brett uh then tim just because i'm fair okay so um it was actually kind of serendipitous because uh, one of our major complaints with uh, the state of amphibious operations in the literature is there's a great focus on large scale amphibious assaults. And when people hear the, the phrase amphibious operations, that's what they think. The large scale, uh, you know, the Gallipolis, the Iwo Jimas, the Normandies, uh, but the smaller or other forms of amphibious operations kind of get left by the wayside, the raids, the demonstrations, uh, the withdrawals, uh, all of uh, which can be pretty uh, potent forms of warfare uh, in the toolbox. So um, we started working on this book uh, with the express purpose of uh, expanding the scope and the diversity of the case studies that people think about and look at uh, when they're examining amphibious operations. And then uh, in 2018, uh, the Commandant of the Marine Corps released his uh, planning guidance and really put the Marine Corps on this trajectory to focus less on those large scale amphibious assaults and more on different forms of amphibious operations and supporting the Navy in different ways. Uh, so we kind of got lucky on that and then uh, it hit it at the right time. Um, and hopefully we get uh, people thinking about those other forms and, help the Marine Corps figure out uh, what it needs to be prepared for in the future. And Tim, what did he miss? I don't 
think he missed anything. Um, you know, again, this was this was a project that came out of a, a gap in the scholarship, and we got lucky. You know, if it, a different commandant could have come in. You know, Brett and I are dirt marines. We we grew up in Iraq. We grew up in Afghanistan. Um, we've, you know, truth be told, we've never actually been on a ship. <laughs> you know, our our initial officer training course didn't. You know, the, the basic school. We didn't go do an amphibious event. We didn't even get to go down and tour a ship, and they're not far from from Quantico. But as we've grown, as we've advanced in rank, and you know, kind of to some extent to influence and, and to be sitting in the right rooms at the right times, this is where we're going. You know, the Marine Corps is not shunning counterinsurgency, but it's getting back to its naval roots, that naval integration piece uh, that the Commandant is is focused on, and so we got just timing wise lucky that, that it's out there and that it's not just the Gallipolis and the, and the Tarawas and um, the Injons, you know, it's the, it is the withdrawals. It is the demonstrations. It's the faints. It's the raids. It's, it's all of the other things that aren't, that don't require a 700 ship Navy in one location shelling a contested shore. Um, You know, it's, 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 it's a, it's a much more, nuanced and a much broader scope and i think that's that's what the chapters show and that's what we wanted the chapters to show so we just didn't get into that you know over the beach mentality the most fascinating fact there is that you haven't been on a ship now i spent a fair bit of my career on ships um including having to write the joint fires concept of operations in the very very early stage for our own amphibious capability, which has grown quite significantly. And the reason I got that gig was because I'd just been in Afghanistan with the Brits. And so they said, oh, well, you know the Brits, so go work with the UK amphibious task group. I mean, that was great while we are in Glasgow, but then they put me on a ship to learn about amphibious operations, and I had to keep reminding them. Uh, I didn't like being on ships, but it just kept happening. So you kind of, trust me, like, you didn't miss anything apart from just a really bad night's sleep. Um but it's also interesting, you know, you mentioned Gallipoli, which is, you know, it's, it's Australia's sort of birth story um, as a nation. And uh, one of my old history professors who used to teach at Quantico, uh, an Australian guy, he, uh, he used to try and do as many case studies at Gallipoli as possible just to show how terrible the, uh, the place was for amphibious landings. Um, but I think history kind of bears that out with the number of Brits, uh, Indians, Canadians and Australians that were, were killed there. Um, and for those Australians listening, uh, Australia wasn't um, the nation who lost the most there. It's just that it was it was kind of our birth our birth moment. Um, but the the commandant um, the story about the commandant's support as well is is quite quite cool. Um, I'd just like to point out that this show is on the commandant's uh, reading or listening list. Um, so you know we've got a fair bit of faith in that in that uh, in that officer and the leadership, um, but. Something else we have faith in is uh, the you fellas to cover a decent chunk of history. Having seen some of the work you've done before, I think, Brett, your book on tactics, you start off with Thucydides in Chapter 1 maybe, um, pretty close to like the first sentence or something like that. It's in there pretty early uh, talking about tactics. So that's a fair whack of history just there. And uh, this book is no different. Um, it goes back some 500 years. Um, and... Uh, and it starts with the night attack. Like the first chapter, I think it is. I'm pretty sure it's chapter one. The night attack on Porto Ercoletto. Um, and I'm sorry to any Italians, uh, especially those from the Tuscan region, that I'm not uh, if I'm not pronouncing that right. Uh, but that was in 1555. Um, so that's an example of of where you've started, and it goes right through to multi domain operations. And you know, Brett, your chapter is talking about the future of naval strategy and amphibious operations. Why was it important? Uh, to take the readers back that deep into history. And, uh, and I'll, I'll get you to open, Tim, and then Brett, fill in, fill in any gaps. Well, we went back that far in part because that's, those are the chapters we got uh, offered and pitched. You know, you're, you're only as good as your source material. Um, but when we, when we came across that chapter in particular, it was an eye-opening reminder, right? I mean, that, that raid is vaguely special operations it's definitely amphibious it's it's got a lot of um direct lineage 
that you, I mean, you could draw a lineage from there to today. And, and so when we were looking at case studies and we were looking at the chapter proposals that came in, we said, you know, we want this broad swath. We want, you know, not just the second world war. We want, you know, more than Gallipoli. Um, we want, we want to go back. We want to take some of these things that we knew a little bit about, you know, and we'll use the 1870s BJ Armstrong's chapter on Korea. Mm-hmm. You know, we were taught about that a little bit, but you know, certainly with a, with a pivot to the Pacific and all of these things we're talking about, like this is an interesting piece of, of history that, that talks about naval integration and talks about diplomacy and, and you know, a lot of the, you know, civil military operations. There's a lot going on in these historical case studies that it's, you know, what we're, what we're not trying to do with these chapters is to, to say, you know, this is the way you embark off of the ship. This is the way you echelon your forces. We, we've, we've got those manuals. But using these historical case studies, we can bring those manuals to life. We can bring conceptual ideas and um, and historical facts together, and, and, and it gives the reader, depending on what their position is, uh, a different perspective. Right? Doctrine is boring. Doctrine is dry. Doctrine is essential, but. You know, I think some of some of the beauty of some of the best written doctrine out there are the case studies that go in it. If if, if it's all high level theory, you, you're going to lose your reader. But if, if you can take something like Porto Ricoletto and introduce that to somebody who had no clue what was going on in the Mediterranean in the 1500s, and they can pull something out of that, like man, we we've we've accomplished what we want there. That's that's that. Mm-hmm. And Britt? Yeah, I just add anytime you're looking at uh, broad p- principles instead of, you know, doc- doctrinal manuals and stuff like that, uh, more is always better. Uh, I don't, if you're going to look for trends across history, then uh, you want to have the largest data set you can find. Um, so I think it's really good that we uh, received chapters and went back that far. And, uh, you know, it's the same I did with on tactics. I wanted to look at the whole width and breadth of tactics, not just uh, focus on a specific area um, and leave it up to, the, you know, that leaves it up to the reader kind of to pull out the major principles for themselves rather than just us being two guys saying this is how you do it. Um, yeah, and so uh, that was good. And I think if we, uh, if we look at doing a uh, second volume, maybe we'll go back even further. It's awesome. Maybe cover, maybe cover Caesar and uh, his landing on the shores of Britain. Um, which is, yeah, it's kind of cool. Um, what I really liked about this was, uh, was you know, some of the concepts and some of the historical chapters that people are considering new. People are you know, developing these concepts and going, I've got this great idea. Um, but like most things, uh, including the format of this show, um, they're all just rip-offs of of previous ideas, right? Um, you've got you've got examples of what we'd call pre-landing force operations, uh, beach reconnaissance teams. The, all those um, sorts of activities ha- have been going on and on. And um, we'll probably find activities here that the Trojans used um, in here. In fact, you know, unfortunately, there's not enough historical documents for someone to have given you a chapter on on on, on the on the siege of Troy and. <laughs> You know, that's a great example of an amphibious force becoming a dirt army over 10 years, right? Um, which is which is not something we haven't seen. Uh, you know, 20 years is a long time as well. So what I enjoyed was not just the, the depth. And, I mean, we, we're just talking about a, um, a clash between um, Spanish and Italian forces in, in the 16th century. So it's not just a depth of history, but you also went through... And around, and and you've got like a very broad, and I'm talking geographically here and culturally, um, swath of chapters as well. Um, So you've got chapters covering amphibious operations from a variety of different military powers throughout history around the globe. I think uh, even in your responses, you talked about Korea, uh, the Southwest Pacific, Central uh, Pacific um, campaigns, uh, Second World War, we've talked about Gallipoli, and we've talked about you know, a, 
basically the War of Siena uh, in the 16th century. So you, we've pretty much gone around the globe there. Um, why is it all so important, I suppose, uh, to include a breadth, um, particularly for a couple of you know United States Marine guys, right? Like so, it's not just a chapter on the history of. US amphibious operations or your allies' operations. It's got everyone in there. Why was it important to go that broad? And uh, we'll reverse order again. And listeners are probably starting to hear a pattern. Uh, the last guy to speak is the next guy up. So, Brett? So, I guess I'd just say, like, uh, you know, the, like we talked about with the, the existing literature on it, focuses on kind of the, the big dramatic battles. Uh, the big world-changing amphibious uh, operations. And if you only focus on those, you're only seeing one side of the story. You're only seeing one way that amphibious forces can be brought to bear in a conflict. Um, and uh, with, you know, diversity in every respect being the goal of this book, uh, we really had to uh, just you know, expand our own horizons too. Like some of the uh, chapters that were submitted, like I had never heard of that. I had no idea that an amphibious operation had occurred at that place in time. So it was, it was really a beneficial learning experience, even for us. And hopefully the readers experience that as well. And too. Yeah. Um, you know, as Brett, as Brett was explaining that, I was thinking specifically of Samuel Decourt's chapter um, about kind of defensive operations and flooding an area to, to force things. And you, know, you think in the Netherlands, and you know, oh, yeah, that's right. And they have had a Marine Corps for, you know, almost as long as the Brits, um, if not longer. Um, and so by including that breadth, by including those diverse case studies and, and, and concepts, we've, we've shown that this isn't a uniquely Western idea. This isn't a uniquely American idea or, or Aussie or, or, or Kiwi or you know, the five eyes don't have the lock on amphibious operations. Mm. Um, we might've done the most um, well-known or the most recent ones, but that's not to say that they weren't happening everywhere else. Mm. You know, kind of, what is it? It's like 70% of the world is covered by water. Like, it means a lot of the population is sitting up against that water looking to go somewhere else, as you said in your intro. Um, and you can make it a, you know, you can go for a nice beach vacation or you could, you could go over the beach to get away from somebody or to get away or to get at somebody. Um, and so there's that. And when we were, you know, you, you alluded to it or you, you said it actually straight out, right? Like, you know, we're Marines. Yeah, we are. But we didn't want to write a book by Marines for Marines about Marines. The goal wasn't to sit here and talk about the glory of Tarawa. The goal was to, to look at the, the broader context, the broader scope of the amphibious operations. And that's the, that was the goal. And we accomplished it, I think. Um, it's up to the reader to tell us if we didn't. But we, we certainly didn't want to get pigeonholed down that, you know, let's talk about Chesty Polar for 200 pages. We, we've, we've been to those schools. We've done those case studies. We've read those books we wanted to present something new and the breadth and scope of the chapters allowed us to do that. Now, we're just a couple of artillerymen here. Um, in fact, you know, we're, we're what's quite dangerous to the world in terms of uh, long conversations. We're, we're a group of reserve artillerymen. So uh, the danger of back in my day and, uh, and the black art of joint fire support combining is quite dangerous. But uh, we're having a yarn about amphibious operations, not fires, but perhaps our listeners would permit us a diversion into the world of fire support. Um, now, the role of gun fire support at Tarawa, uh, it's covered in this book. Um, I love that it was in here. Uh, as I said before we started recording, uh, I'm glad it was in there because you got my attention. Um, but, uh, you know, I've, I've presented case studies on, on that particular um operation uh, and and generally in fire support in the Central Pacific campaign because it's fascinating how land-based fires were used uh, in, in that particular area of the world um, as well as as well as the way that uh, air-based fires developed quite rapidly um, and 
you know, some of the some of the changes we talk about doctrine. We talk about um, you know, there's this guy. I'm not sure if you've ever heard of him, Brett uh, Pete Ellis. I think you, you may have may have heard of him. May have written a book on him. <laughs> but um, but uh, you know, interestingly enough, had, had done a doctrinal study in the 1920s that um, people uh, had a look at, ignored, and then ended up operating almost exactly how he'd written it during the Central uh, Pacific Campaign in certain areas. Um, so I was excited to read uh, the chapter on Tarawa by James McGrath in your book. Uh, that, that's a long way of saying, um, you know, you, you hit me right in the feels uh, in terms of fire support and having it in there. But um, I, I guess I want to know from your reading of your, the chapters that have been submitted to you, and um, I just want to make it clear to a lot of listeners out there, this book is in no means about uh, fire support. So if my spiel during this question has made you think it's just a book on fire support and amphibious operations it's not maybe that can be a follow-up um but i'm keen to understand how fire support has changed throughout the history of amphibious operations based on what you've seen in the book and uh we'll go uh flip the order again so tim um we'll go to you first well i'm so i'm glad we were able to put rounds on target there uh (laughs) to, to, to to pique your interest the I mean, the evolution of fire support is, is, is addressed in the book. It's kind of the history of evolution, of the evolution of fire support in general, right? You go from, I can see you, I might be able to reach you. Um, and then to, well, I can find you and I can kill you from afar, right? That's the, you know, as we get into multi-domain effects, or I don't even have to find you. I can disrupt your ability to move. I can disrupt your ability to find me. I can do all of those things. And so, you know, I mean... James McGrath's chapter on, on fire support at Tarawa is I think probably the most direct one we have on that, but the other chapters all cover elements of it um, explicitly or non-explicitly. I'm thinking of Greg Leadkey's chapter. I don't think it's actually in there when he's talking about withdrawals, but if you were to write the counter to that chapter, right, to flip, to flip the map around and write German withdrawals in, in, in the East during the second world war from the Soviet perspective, fire support, as a counter to that amphibious operation, I think I would be in there. And as, as the Marines, you know, are, are talking about naval integration and we're talking about advanced based operations and, and Walker Mills's chapter covers that. Um, we're talking about not just ship to shore or air to shore, but we're talking shore to ship uh, and, and how that integration plays out. So certainly, you know, if, if we do do a volume two, Mick, and you want to, you want to write something about air to shore fires from the Central Pacific? We'd be, we'd be keen to consider your proposal. It's a dangerous question because, uh, or offer because, uh, as you probably know, I'm terrible with a deadline and I'm quite verbose. So, you've got yourself a problem there. Um, I'll accept and then cause your life pain, uh, Brett. Before I start causing you guys pain in the future, um, your thoughts on the the evolution of fire support during amphibious operations. Uh, I, I think it's interesting that for most of history, at least recent history, um, amphibious fire support has been, su- the, you know, supporting the troops as they're going ashore and once they're ashore uh, from the sea. So you're using fire support either um, from the ship or uh, aviation fire support. Uh, uh, from naval aviation to support those troops. Um, but now I think we're starting to see, and Tim alluded to this, that uh, shore-based anti-ship capabilities uh, threaten the, uh, the ability to establish sea control. And one of the principles across history for amphibious operations is you, you need some uh, preponderance of sea control to even pull off, begin pulling off one of these operations. And now that that's threatened uh, or uh, more easily threatened from shore-based fires, so how, how does fire support play into not just supporting the troops ashore, but gaining and maintaining the sea control required to uh, execute the operation? Um, I don't know that we have good answers to that yet. Um, I certainly don't. Um, but I think that's probably where um, amphibious operations is headed in the future a little bit. How do we use fires to uh, protect the ships at sea, not just the troops ashore? That's, a, that's, that's an important aspect, particularly when we talk about 
uh, air defence bubbles, um, which increasingly when we talk about air defence bubbles, they're just not a- against aircraft. They're, they're against anything that, um, I guess, flies through the air. If, if you take it back to basic, you see how I could never write doctrine because I'm a bit too simple. Um, but they are, you know, it's it's an interesting point because I know Australia's development of amphibious capabilities has been a strong emphasis on the air warfare destroyer to build that that bubble to protect the ships as they're coming aboard, but you've, you've got that gap. So it's fascinating. Um, it must have been fascinating uh, editing this book because, you know, there's, there's so many questions that each chapter um, pushes you to ask as well, which is, you know, it's a sign of a good book, right? Like you don't, they don't just give you the answers. They give you the hunger to sort of know more. Um, but we could probably discuss joint fires all day. In fact, I know we could um, because it's, it's quite early in our days where we are. Uh, different days. I'm in the future. You guys are in the past. Um, but don't worry. Uh, from what from what twenty uh, twenty one's been showing us, it doesn't get better. Um, but let's talk about. Um, we could talk about naval special warfare. Uh, we could talk about naval strategy. Um, there are so many topics in this book, and um, we could talk about them until the cows come home. Which I'm not sure if that's a phrase in the US, but it's a phrase in Australia. It's probably inherited from the UK, to be honest. Um, but unfortunately, the cows will take a while because um, I don't live in a rural area. Um, and uh, and we actually have the bonus and the final questions coming up. And uh, I've got to actually um, cut to the chase now. So we're, we're looking at some significant changes to the character of warfare. Uh, I'll admit that. Uh, Big Carl would say there's changes to the nature of warfare. And, you know, the, the whole chameleon metaphor comes in perfectly right now. Um, the role of amphibious operations is... And, and, you know, arguably, based on reading this book, uh, may always have been a uh, crucial in strategic power projection. There's a lot of money going into amphibious operations and defence budgets around the globe. Anyone who's got a shoreline is putting some money in. Uh, for those people who have not been to South America, uh, Lake Titicaca, sitting on top of the world, has navies in it. Um, <coughs> it's quite, quite strange uh, for an Australian um, who, you know, understands navies to be saltwater capabilities to see such thing as freshwater navies. Amphibious operations and, you know, naval strategy to achieve strategic power projection is going to be something that dominates defence policy quite a bit in the future, in my opinion. That is until the Five Eyes community gets sucked into another land war somewhere. Now, my, my question is, how does the historical role of amphibious operations fit with or be affected by some of the other new concepts, some of the ones we would probably call buzzwords or um, or fads or ones that seem to be quite important uh, and also importantly driving a lot of the conversation. And those, those terms such as multi-domain operations, um, which did sound cooler when it was multi-domain battle. Um, information operations, you know, space and cyber-based operations. How does that see uh, amphibious operations fit? Uh, into these concepts, or how do they fit into amphibious operations? And uh, I think we've got the pattern down, so we'll go with Brett. Well, uh, you know, this my chapter kind of took that one head on. Um, you know, and basically the conclusion I came up with is that your large scale amphibious assaults, the ones we, you know, wanted to move away from looking at, uh, are going to be even more rare than they are today. Um, it's really difficult to hide a fleet from uh, space-based uh, observation, uh, especially a concentrated one right off the shoreline. Um, it's really hard to keep information on that kind of scale secret. Uh, so I, I, I think uh, multi-domain operations, that's a way that the Army is trying to figure out how to put all that stuff together. Uh, but even if those things aren't tied in together directly, uh, they're going to have an effect on how amphibious operations are carried out. And my conclusion was that um, in, in our joint doctrine, we've got five forms of amphibious operations, the, the assault, the withdrawal, the demonstration, the raid, and amphibious support to other operations. And my conclusion was, um, even though the Marine Corps is very focused on amphibious assaults, it needs to start focusing more on those other four because they will be more common and more critical uh, than the assault itself. Um, so I kind of think that's where that's going with the, you know, the changing character of warfare. And um, don't think it's going to be an obsolete capability at all. Like you said, uh, 
uh, almost every major Marine Corps in the world is expanding except for the United States Marine Corps. It's the only one that's contracted. Um, so our adversaries and our allies see benefit in amphibious operations. Uh, they are investing in that capability for the future. And uh, we are kind of in a different spot of figuring out not how to create that capability, but how to change that capability for uh, uh, modern, the modern battle, battlefield. And uh, two. I mean, amphibious operations are inherently multi-domain. We have two chapters in the book specifically focused on that. We've got um, Jim Greer's chapter on Norway in 1940, the German operation there. And we've got Keith Dixon's chapter that's significantly more conceptual, but they are inherently multi-domain. I, what is it? Churchill said that, that they're, they're trifibious, right? They're, they're air, land, and sea. And, and now, you know, if, if he was around, we'd have some other great turn of phrase to include space, to include the cyber, the piece of it. Um, you know, I think the only, the only major fleet operation that was successfully hid from space-based sensors was in Red Storm Rising. Um, but Tom Clancy fiction aside, like, those are considerations and, and there probably won't be that 700 ship armada sitting off of the coast of, of a small island in the Pacific shelling it for days before Marines go over the beach or, you know, whomever that's perpetrating them. So the integration with these other domains is, is going to be essential. And we hope that, that the chapters in our book that specifically address it, cover it in a way that does leave for that hunger um, or, or maybe provide some, some basis for thought. And, you know, Brad alluded to a volume two. So maybe that's, that's an angle we start chasing uh, a little bit more when we're looking for chapters there. The good thing about looking for chapters in buzzword territory is that you'll have plenty of uh, submissions. In it. Um, you know, wildly more submissions than you do uh, actual chapters, but that's good, right? That's that's a good position to be in for an editor. Um, now, we're going to go to the bonus question, uh, mainly because uh, people uh, pay a premium subscription and... Uh, and I have to live up to a very baseline level of service for them, and I do a good job of keeping it at that baseline level. Um, so we'll do that, and for anyone who doesn't subscribe, as I've said previously, I don't really care that you don't get the bonus question because you don't give me any money. So we'll have a quick pause. All right, listeners, uh, that was a fantastic response on what I might say is uh, the most well-crafted and articulated bonus question we've ever had on this show. Um, the complexity of and nuance in that question uh, was only surpassed by the answers. So thank you, gents. And thank you, TDP subscribers, for subscribing to the show. Now, we've come to the butcher's bill, uh, Tim and Brett. Uh, we've come to the final question. It's one I ask all guests and it relates to our show or relates to our show and it relates to our mission on the show to define wars in as many ways as possible just like big carl the dead brush himself now you've both experienced this moment once before so you know you've you're about to have your second apotheosis uh, and for listeners who don't understand that means it's basically becoming god so I ask uh, you two separately, don't answer at the same time and don't give the same answer, and don't you don't have to give the same answer you gave last time. If you did, you'd show consistency of thought and reliability, but also stagnation. If you give a different answer, it shows growth, opportunity, um, but a little bit of whimsy and flightiness. So you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. The question is, uh, finish the sentence, war is. So I ask you, Brett, first, and then Tim, to finish the sentence, war is. Well, I was thinking on how to answer it this time, and I could not figure out a way to tie it into this book. So I will lean in, I will take us in a completely different direction. My quarantine binge reading has been in the complexity sciences and chaos theory. And I don't know. I don't even remember how I got into it, but uh, been reading at a frantic pace. Uh, 
to try to learn that field. So I will say and lean into a future article of mine that war is a political competition between complex social adaptive systems. And um, that is an area where I think we are in the cusp of uh, learning a lot of new insights about war. And uh, one of the aims of this article I'm working on is to uh, talk about how the first person to wrestle with uh, war as a complex system was our favorite dead Prussian himself, Carl von, Carl von Clausewitz. That, that's a good answer. I like that. I like that uh, response. It's very similar to a couple we had on a course that I, I ran for one of the army schools here in Australia last year because we had quite a few people who had studied um, complex systems. So, uh, and I also like the fact that you mentioned Big Carl and you know, complex adaptive systems come to us primarily from an ecological, biological point of view. And uh, and Carl was all about using science to explain military theory. So, yeah, it's going to be a tough one to beat. Jeez, I'm glad I don't have to follow you. But Tim does. So, Tim? I'm taking a big, deep breath. Uh, <laughs> going through my my meditation phases um yeah that, that was a good one i don't you know the last time i was here i was i was a new parent um not a one-year-old and so my answer was about her uh, and how parenting is surreal and war is surreal because i was i was very definitely thinking about you know my experiences in iraq um and afghanistan for the last interview for this one though i think i think i'm going to take a, a little bit of a step uh away certainly from changing diapers. Fortunately, she's toilet trained now, so I don't have to worry about that. But um, I think war is, well, I don't know what I think. Uh, no, I, I think war is good for business. <laughs> Invest your sons. Um, I mean, from our perspective, from my perspective as a writer, as an editor, this is where I make my money. This is where I, I do put food on the table. Um, but this is also what gives me a sense of, uh, of intellectual fulfillment and engagement. So it's, it's more than just a, the business of a cash transaction. It's the business of my life. Um, and so it becomes something that I have invested in. You know, I, I'm somebody's son and I've invested myself in this. So war is good for business. Invest your sons. <laughs> or uh, daughters. Let's be gender neutral. Uh, yeah. yeah let's my apologies. Um, Let's throw every every aspect of human capital we have at the uh, at the problem. We have spent an incredible amount of money uh, on the hardware of war, so yeah, it's time to, to invest some intellectual capital as well. Now, gents, uh, two great definitions that have shown um, that you're not stagnant and that you are evolving. I uh, thank you. Uh, to be honest, I didn't check what your last answers were, so I was probably going to say that anyway. That's nothing on you. That's just because I'm a lazy host. Um, thank you very much for coming on the show. Thank you for being uh, patient uh, with scheduling uh, disruptions to the show. Um, we've gone uh, a little bit off schedule this year, but I think uh, we can be forgiven a little bit. But it's it's been great, um, and I'm glad that we, we stuck uh, to the desire to talk because I think our listeners – We'll get a really big kick out of this book, and uh, because it's an edited volume, they can jump in anywhere at any chapter and pick up the thread, um, which is good because for a lot of listeners out there, they have, you know, a bit like Brett's binge reading. They have particular topics that they're interested in right now. So if they grab uh, either the electronic or the hard copy of this book, then they will be able to dive in now, and then when they get interested in something else, when they get a little bit older or wiser, although some of our listeners are quite old, they're not going to get much older or wiser, they can then jump across um, to something else, which is which is what I love. Um, we've already discussed, I jump to one particular chapter uh, straight away, and what listeners will see is that um, they can kind of understand from the questions where I jumped around in the, uh, in the book, because we kind of talked about the things that I, I like the most in the book. Um, that's not to say I haven't read every word and every full stop, but um, it's uh, it's great to sort of uh, have that sort of book there. And uh, I know there are a lot of people that will appreciate it, so they'll need to find out where to go, and they can go to the U.S. Marine Corps University website to find it. Or uh, there's this other really cool tool I use. It's called Google, 
uh, just type in on contested shorts and you'll uh, it'll come up and you can get a PDF copy or uh, you can also order hard copies through the United States Marine Corps University, um, which I want to call the MTU, but I think that's the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Um, Brett, Tim, thank you very much for coming on the show. Mick, thanks for having us. Uh, it's been a pleasure, and I hope you get a little bit of rest with your newborn. Yeah, thank you. And uh, ladies and gents, please support uh, the fellows uh, in this book. Uh, read it, pass it around. I've just told you where to get it. If you are not um, the outgoing president of the United States, you can access Twitter and uh, log on, uh, follow uh both Tim and Brett. Uh, Tim is at TGHEC1 and Brett is at BA underscore Friedman. Uh, and uh, join the conversation because they're quite, they're quite chatty on, uh, on Twitter, um, particularly about this sort of stuff, um, which is great. It's, it's one of the ways that I, I connected with them. And uh, so if you're an artillery out there, Twitter's absolutely fantastic. Uh, it's, it's basically a fires net um, that, that, an all-informed fires net, which makes it absolutely brilliant. Um, but listeners, amphibious operations are quite important. They're going to get bigger. But what we need is a good understanding, just like Big Carl said, you know, find out what went before to find out where we're going. I'm not sure if he actually said that, but that was the crux of what he was talking about. Until next time, listeners, grab a book and crack on. Join the conversation with us on Twitter at Dead Prussian Pod on Facebook at The Dead Prussian page or on our website www.thedeadprussian.com. All show notes for this episode as well as copyright information can be found on the website. The Dead Prussian podcast is written, produced and hosted by Mick Cook. It is co-produced by Amanda Levito. The music used throughout is Caught in the Beat by Broke for Free and is used under a Creative Commons attribution licence. All opinions expressed by individuals on the podcast are those of the individual and not necessarily representative of any other organisation.